up, everyone? Kim Becker and Arab Dean here with another Colorado Avalanche AMA brought to you by Mile High Sports. Of course, make sure that you're following Arif on Twitter and Mile High Sports on Twitter when we send out this weekly tweet in order for you to ask Arif any kind of question that you want when it comes to the Colorado Avalanche. So, Arif, first of all, I hope you had a, a wonderful holiday weekend. I probably should have said that right off the bat. How you <laughs> I'm doing great. A, a little bit better than the Avalanche, who took a noon flight on Thanksgiving Day to Nashville to get there to find out that there was a water main break at Bridgestone Arena, some flooding going on. So they turned right back around, got right back on that airplane and flew right back to Denver. So a Thanksgiving well spent for the Avalanche. And of course, that's what happens on Thanksgiving. Like they play 82 <laughs> games a year and it has to be that one where they all left on Thanksgiving yeah, Day. Brutal. So it's also brutal. it's also just funny that it happened in Nashville because last year the Avalanche had the, the COVID pause that happened when they went to Nashville. They got to Nashville and five guys tested positive for COVID. So something about going there just gets them at this time of year every year. I think we need to just wipe Nashville off of their schedule this time of year, right? The Preds can come here. We'll, we'll make sure that... The abs don't travel to Nashville next time. No, but um, okay. Well, Eric, we've got quite a few questions from fans. Obviously the abs have been doing pretty well. Um, the last few games, we'll definitely get to that. But the first question that we have with all these call-ups that are happening, right? We've got so many injuries right now with the Colorado Avalanche and all of these call-up guys are playing, but who do you think can stay in the league when all of the regulars are back? Uh, the big one for me is Anton Bleed. So you're seeing some of those names at the bottom. Martin Kaut, Sampo Ranta. Uh, they've also had Oscar Olason for a game. They've had Shane Bowers for a couple shifts before he got hurt too. Uh, quite a few guys have been called up. The one that sticks out to me is Anton Bleed simply because of the role that the Avalanche would have available if they get fully healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Kaut won't do much for you on the fourth line. He's a guy that needs to be playing scoring line minutes. Uh, Sampo Ranta needs to be playing scoring line minutes. Granted, he hasn't even been good in that opportunity. Anton Bleed is the perfect kind of depth forward to pitch in on the fourth line when they're fully healthy. Um, the only one that I would also kind of mention is Martin Cowd. If the Avalanche need a third line winger to play with Comfer and with Rodriguez, he would be the one to stick out. But I also feel like by the time we get there, um, if the team gets fully healthy, they'll they'll go out and trade for another guy at the trade deadline and really shore up that middle six depth. So to me, the guy that should have made a, you know, sh should have made a bigger impact at training camp and like solidified a roster spot is Anton Bleed. And he's the one that sticks out to me as the guy that should be a fourth line depth option, 13th forward type of option when all said and done. When all is said and done, when everyone is back and healthy, which leads me in to my next question. How the heck are the Colorado Avalanche <laughs> still able to win all of these games? I mean, against a division leaders like the Dallas stars. It's insane. They're still two able twice, to, twice against the in stars, the last, yeah. like three games, right? Yeah. I mean, it's wild. How do you think they are doing this with all of the injuries that they have across the board on their roster right now? <laughs> so during uh, the second period the other night when the avalanche were up three to one, I want to say I turned to the guys in the press box and I said, I'm going to go into that press conference with Jared Bednar. And I'm just going to look at him and say, how the f do you guys keep doing this? But I took that question and I made it a little more G-rated. And I asked him exactly that. Like, you guys have all these injuries. You're eight and two in your last ten. How are you doing this? And yeah. he started off by saying, I don't know. Oh. And then went on to give a very eloquent Love answer it. that the guys that are pitching in are they're they're committing to the system, they're committing to the checking and to the game that Jared likes, but it's his coaching. Ultimately, it's his coaching that's leading the charge because if you look at some numbers, like you, you dig into some more advanced numbers, things like how often is Nathan McKinnon's line starting in the offensive zone? It's about 20 to 30% higher than usual. So what he's doing is it's very clear. The avalanche have one scoring line right now, and it's very clear. They have one reliable defensive line being JT Confer with O'Connor and Cogliano. Yeah. So what Jared's doing is every chance he gets to start that scoring line in the offensive zone, he is. He doesn't have four lines to roll. He's got McKinnon to score. He's got Comfort to defend. And then he's got these other two lines to kind of throw in for seven, eight, nine, sometimes 10 minutes a game. So not much. He's not, he doesn't have the four lines to roll like usual. So I would say it's that Jared has done a great job at, um, uh, at really rolling the lines. And then the other one is Alexander Georgiev's a 933 goalie. He's yeah, wow. playing better than even I expected. And I expected big things from him. So it's, 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 when you're a Stanley Cup winning team, when you've got that winning culture and you've got guys like that and that kind of guy behind the bench, um, it's very easy to bring people in and no matter who gets in there, they buy into the system and you keep winning. 
Well, I mean, talk about leadership, like you said, also, you know, comes from the top. So having Coach Bednar in there, and I love that he says, I don't know, because he obviously can't go give away if he does know why they're they're winning all of these games. He doesn't <laughs> want to tell anyone else their secret sauce right now. But I just think that the way that he comes across as a head coach and as a leader of this team, I'm sure just keeps these guys so motivated and keeps them so focused and dialed in, which is so wonderful to see. My next question is pretty pretty similar to that that I just asked, but someone asked specifically, this team is 8-2 and two over the last 10 games. I mean, how do you think that they have really turned that corner after the rough start that they have? Or do you think that they have turned that corner? They've absolutely turned that corner. And the biggest reason for me is just, just the consistency. I mean, this team has been... For the last three seasons, for whatever reason, they don't start strong. Two years ago, they were 4-4-2 four, four, and two in their last 10, and people were calling for Jared Bednar's job. And mm-hmm. last year, they were 4-5-1 and one in their last 10, in their first 10, and people were once again calling for Bednar's job. This year, they did a little bit better, 5-4-1, and one, because they won that 10th game. Um, but then they get on a roll after it. And, and for whatever reason, this seems to be the pattern the team has. It takes them a little bit of time to get out of the gate. The more impressive part to me is the, the last question we answered is, Despite the fact that they have all these injuries, they have these guys in and out of the lineup, they've found a way to still get rolling while having all these depth pieces. There are six or seven guys in the lineup right now that aren't going to see the light of day when, when, if, I should say, not when, but if this team gets fully healthy, they're not going to be playing and they're still winning with them. So it's just a matter of, like I said, the coaching, like I said, the guys buying into the system, I, I, Alexander Georgiev making those saves, Nathan McKinnon, Kill McCarr doing their thing. But most importantly, it's a team that usually takes a little bit of time to get going. And once again, it seems to be like that again. Well, I definitely want to talk to you about Georgiev here in a minute. So we'll get to that because it sounds like everything that he's doing, I mean, you just hear every game, it seems like he's just doing something even better than the last. So I definitely want to get your take on Georgiev between the pipes here in a minute, Arif. But um, our next question here, this was a, a little tidbit of information that we all got from you this morning. The Avs have signed Alex Galchenyuk to a one-year deal for the remainder of the season. Can you talk about this deal for a little bit for us? Yeah, so Alex Galchenyuk was on a professional tryout at training camp, and he was actually doing pretty well. He he seemed to be doing a little bit of what Jack Johnson did last year and kind of earning a roster spot at a training camp on a PTO. And then suddenly the Avalanche cut him on the third day of training camp, and we were all kind of confused. And we talked to Jared, and he said that Galchenyuk got hurt. And that he was going to need some time to recover and that they would revisit signing him when he's healthy. Well, a couple of weeks ago, Rodriguez, or sorry, not Rodriguez, Galchenyuk joined the Colorado Eagles and he's been playing some American Hockey League games and he's up to speed now. He's healthy. So they did exactly what Jared said they were going to do two months ago. They revisited it. They signed him. It's a league minimum contract and it comes at a great time for a team that needs scoring depth and and needs help up front right now, given all the injuries. So um, this is a good, good move for the avalanche. He'll be plugged right into the lineup tomorrow, playing with a team that he skated with quite a bit in the regular, in the training camp. And he played some preseason games with them as well. Uh, He's a guy that used to be, you know, more of a scoring threat in his NHL career. He was a third overall draft pick in 2012, one year after Gabe Landeskog was drafted second overall, and one year before Nathan McKinnon was drafted first first overall. So he's not that old. He scored 30 goals in the NHL before, but his career the last three, four years has kind of gone the way of being more of a depth piece that just kind of pitches in here and there. Um, but you know what? The Avalanche did something similar with Val- Valeri Nichushkin years ago, and, you know, he's turned into a star. I'm not saying Galchenyuk's going to get there, but when you're joining a good team and you buy into the system, you're more likely to improve and kind of uh, really, r- really take take full advantage of the role that you're given. And right now, given the injuries that the Avalanche have, he's going to be given a good opportunity to score. And uh, I think he's going to make the most of it. So it's it's an exciting signing for the Avalanche. It was during training camp an exciting depth pickup. But now, given all the injuries they have with Rodriguez out, Landis Gog, Nichushkin, Helm, uh, Martin Kaut, by the way, who we've been talking about, I just saw a tweet come through from practice that he's sick, so he's not making the trip tomorrow either. Uh, quite a few injuries. It, it'll be great for the Avalanche to get this guy uh, into the lineup and, and on a scoring line. 
Wow. Awesome. Well, like you said, consistency is key. So hopefully they can continue that even with more injuries or sicknesses or whatever, whatever may happen over the next couple of weeks, but that's pretty awesome. I love hearing those kinds of stories. Let's go back to Georgiev here. Eric. We've got a question from a fan and they said, is it time to seriously start considering Georgiev a serious contender for the Vezina trophy? Whoever this fan is, I need to ask him if he's been listening to Hockey Mountain High, your go-to avalanche podcast, because we have been hammering this away, JJ and I, for the last two weeks. That Look, the, it's, there comes a time where you have to differentiate between a good goalie playing on a good team and a goalie whose numbers are inflated because he's playing on a good team. Yeah. Philip Grubauer is a good goalie, uh, but he's not a Vezina Trophy finalist on any other team other than the Avalanche when he's playing on that stack roster. Darcy Kemper is a good goalie, but he's not a Stanley Cup winner and a 921 goalie on any other team consistently like he mm-hmm. is when he plays on a stack roster like the Avalanche. Mm-hmm. Georgiev does more than that. Because what we've seen in the early part of this season, last year the Avalanche were stringing off all these wins, waiting for Kemper to get accustomed and adjusted to his new team. And he did, and then he went on to have an excellent regular season. Right now, the Avalanche aren't scoring a lot of goals. I think we talked about it last week. They went five or six games in a row where they hit the under because they're not scoring as much as they usually do. Understandably so, they have one scoring line right now. The difference this year compared to last year is Alexander Georgiev is standing on his head. He is so consistent. He is so good right now that, like, when we were sitting in the press box the other day, he made a save, and I looked at JJ, and I'm like, dude, this guy's great. Like, he's legitimately, in my opinion, the best goalie the Avalanche have had since Patrick Waugh. He's wow. been excellent. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for the rest of the NHL and kind of the national media to get a hold of what this guy's doing because he's playing on a good team. And we saw this with Kemper and now he's, his numbers aren't as good with Washington. We saw it with Grubauer whose numbers dipped when he went to Seattle. But with this guy, it's, it's a different feel. It's a guy that seems like I genuinely believe over the next 12 to 24 months, he's going to be considered one of the top goalies in the NHL if this continues, because all he needed was an opportunity. He's getting that. He's playing every other night. And I don't usually like to pump goalies tires when they're playing on good teams, but this is so beyond just that. So I'm on the Georgiev hype train. I have been for the last few weeks. I know JJ Jerez is. I know uh, at Malahai Sports, we love Alexander Georgiev, and, and there's no reason not to right now. Well, I will say there's something to be said when you're actually physically in the arena watching these games firsthand and watching goalies firsthand. Because, yes, when you see it on TV, you're like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Look at that save. But like you just said, when you turned to JJ and you were like, holy cow, that was an amazing save. I mean, you see something a little bit different when you're there in person. So I I love hearing your answers to all of these questions, Eric, because I know how close you've been to the team and to practices and everything. So yeah, definitely exciting to hear that. Yeah, really. Yeah. Really quickly right now, the top five goalies in the NHL in terms of save percentage, uh, number one in the NHL is Linus Allmark in Boston. And he's 13 and one on the season because Boston's just been incredible. Georgiev's number two, two at 933 save percentage. Georgiev is 10, two and one. Then it's Sorokin. Then it's Hellebuck. Then it's Vanacek. Sorokin from the Islanders is getting a lot of love. Yeah. Hellebuck has had a massive bounce back of a season for the Jets and getting a lot of love. Vitek Vanacek went to the Devils. He's getting a lot of loves because of the season that they're having. Not a lot of people are talking about Georgie right now. And I think it's going to take some yeah. time again. The Avalanche are the defending cup champs. This happens every year. A team wins the Stanley Cup. By the time the following fall comes around, you don't really want to talk about them. You want to talk about other teams. And then when you get to March or April, you remember, oh, hey, by the way, the Tampa Bay Lightning are incredible and they're going to be on a, they're going to be a a, a tough team to beat again. So that's kind of what's going to happen with the Avalanche. And I think Georgie's going to get his recognition here soon. And especially if he keeps up with these numbers on a team that has this many injuries. Can you read us the save rates of those top five? I just want to know the discrepancy between them. Yep. Linus Olmark leads the NHL at 935. Okay. Uh, yeah. And wow. this is among starters. Georgie's a 933. Sorokin's a 933. Hellebuck's a 925. Vanacek's a 923. Okay. And then from there, the next starter that you have is way down for Vegas. Logan Thompson's a 920. And Billy Huso in Detroit's a 919. So those 933s and 35s from Sorokin, Georgie, and Olmark, those are your far and away best goalies in the NHL right now. And they're on three of the best teams in the NHL right now. Awesome. Well, very exciting. We'll definitely keep our eye on that one. But to wrap this up, we've got a fun question. And I know we talked about it a little bit and we both love this. But do you think that the Colorado Avalanche have the best reverse retro jerseys this season? 
from a biased look, yes, absolutely. Uh, from an unbiased look, I haven't really seen all of them like I did a couple of years ago. I know Minnesota's is great. Florida's is a lot of fun. Uh, I kind of like Dallas's, but this okay. one right here. So here is the part that people seem to be confusing. People think that the Avalanche took this jersey and they're kind of doing a reverse retro and uh, as an ode to the Colorado Rockies, which are now the New Jersey Devils, the old team that used to play in the in Colorado before the Avalanche came around in 95, way back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. That's not correct at all. Mm -hmm. Just because they're using the Colorado flag colors, it doesn't mean it's an ode to those jerseys. What the Avalanche did here is they took the very first Colorado Avalanche jersey, the one they had from 1995 through 2007 before Reebok came in and put in those atrocious apron-looking jerseys. Mm -hmm. From 95 to 07, this is what the jersey looked like. What the Avs did now is they took that jersey, they put the primary logo on the shoulder, they took that new Colorado Sea logo that they've loved for five or six years, put it as the main crest, and then they switched the colors around. The double mountain stripe, that's an old school Peter Forsberg, Patrick Waugh, Joe Sackick look right there. That. that letter A that you see, the font for the A, the font for the 96, the font for the jersey numbers on the back, those are the old numbers from 95 to 2007 where – literally JJ and I, the entire game, when you see number 18 skating around, we're like, yeah, that's Adam Deadmarsh. When you see number six skating or number eight, Kale McCarr, we're like, yeah, that's Sandus Ozelinch. Like everything about it looked like wow. the old school avalanche because yeah. they really took, and even the socks, the three colors right there, the red, yellow, and uh, blue there. Those are exactly how the socks used to look. So what the abs did was took the old Jersey, gave it a twist with the Colorado flag colors, changed around the primary logo, put the primary logo on the shoulders and you have this beautiful thing. It pops so well off the ice, on TV, uh, when you're watching it live. It, In my opinion, and this is going to be a hot take, is better than their last reverse retro, which everybody loved, the Quebec Nordique ones. I love them. Did you see that girl in that previous photo? She was in the front row. She was wearing one. She's already got one. There was a ton of fans wearing wow. them. I was very impressed. Wow. Uh, and they didn't look that good when they first came out. But when you see the full kit and you kind of start yeah. to realize, like, this is the old jersey with the player numbers, which you didn't really see beforehand. Right. I really like it. And, like, this is something that if the Avalanche ever changed from burgundy and blue, which I don't think they will, those are the colors to go to. It, it just looks so good on the ice. I love it. Awesome. Well, Arif, thank you so much. Everybody listening in, thank you as well. Make sure that you are following Arif at RunRightArif on Twitter so that when he sends out that tweet weekly – for this AMA that we have on Mile High Sports, you can get all of your Colorado Avalanche questions in and answered when Arif and I return next Monday. But I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope the Avs have a wonderful week, and we will have a lot more wonderful things to talk about next week, Arif. Sounds great. I'm really excited for this upcoming week. The Avalanche are going to be playing every other night starting December, wow. uh, minus the Christmas holiday. Uh, but it starts with this road trip, and it's going to be a big one, especially tomorrow. They're playing the Winnipeg Jets. That's the other team there in the division that's tied with them. So Amazing. big game coming up for the Avs. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you so much, and have fun covering the team. We'll talk next week. Sounds good. Thanks a lot.